Coming up on Harvard Chan This Week in Health, the power of positive thinking. Optimistic people actually act in healthier ways. So some studies have shown that higher optimism associated with higher quality sleep, better eating, more exercise. In this episode, we'll explore new research highlighting the health benefits of optimism and strategies to improve your psychological well-being. Hello and welcome to Harvard Chan This Week in Health. It's Thursday, December 15th, 2016. I'm Noah Levitt. And I'm Amy Montemiro. This week we're talking all about optimism, a general expectation that good things will happen. And there's new research from the Harvard Chan School showing that having a positive outlook on life may come with some significant health benefits. The study led by Eric Kim, a research fellow in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences, found that women who were optimistic had a significantly reduced risk of dying from several major causes of death over an eight-year study period, compared to women who described themselves as less optimistic. I spoke with Kim about this study and the growing body of evidence that our emotional well-being is closely tied to our physical health. And he says this is a new way to think about health care and prevention. A lot of health care today is not about health. And it's about uh, risk reduction and disease management, which is extremely important. But um, the system is beginning to realize that enhancing resilience factors and health assets might be a unique way in which we can enhance health. So that's why we're interested in optimism. For this study, we looked at 70,000 women from the Nurses' Health Study, which is coming out from the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And optimism was assessed at 2004, and then mortality was assessed after that. And we also looked at, we ca- looked at all-cause mortality, but also specific types of mortality as well. And so what did you find in terms of the association between um, someone's sense of optimism and kind of these causes of mortality and overall mortality? When we looked at the most optimistic women, which is the top 25 percent versus the least optimistic women, which is bottom 25 percent, we saw that um, there was about a 30 percent risk reduction. And uh, this is an association and not causation, but correlation. But, and um, we controlled for all kinds of potential confounders as well, though things like baseline health, because there's this question, what if they're just more optimistic because they're healthier? So we really uh, looked at that really carefully, statistically, as things like that. People think optimistic are all just cheerful, sunny, chirpy people, but actually there are optimistic people who appear to be actually kind of sadder or things, but internally believe that things will get better, and they're also optimists, and I don't think a lot of people realize that. One really important thing is that this isn't for any, everyone. Some people have varying levels of optimism for all kinds of reasons. Some that are within our control, uh, some patterns of thinking, but a lot also that are not within our control. For example, uh, parental warmth ball growing up predicts optimism later on. Uh, Different levels of socioeconomic status have a weak association with optimism. So there's lots of social factors. So as a society, I think we can think about ways in the future of perhaps creating policies or education programs that give people an equal way to enhance optimism and a lot of the coping strategies that go along with it. Another thing is that some people are just are pessimistic and they don't want to be more optimistic and that's a preference and I think that's totally fine. We shouldn't, you know, put optimism upon everyone. Do we have a sense of kind of why this sense of optimism might have these health benefits? Yeah, there's three main hypotheses that people have and one is that optimistic people actually act in healthier ways. So some studies have shown that higher optimism associated with higher quality sleep, better eating, more exercise. So that's one pathway. Uh, Another potential pathway might be that optimistic people actually cope better with stressful life situations. There was a recent review of about 50 studies that showed that more optimistic people do things like make more contingency plans when things go wrong, like what do they do, step B. Uh, They seek more support when they're in stressful times. They actually accept circumstances that are unattainable, and all these other strategies that all go to reduce stress. And some, mo- lots of types of stress have a bad effect on the body. Uh, the third hypothesis is the newest one and the least tested, but optimism may actually directly impact our biology. It might, um, might be some past association studies saw that optimism is associated with lower inflammation, higher antioxidants, and better lipid profiles. And so I think this ties in well to what you kind of mentioned at the beginning, that the, this idea of, you know, when we look at health, not just kind of treating diseases, not being reactive, maybe being a little more proactive. So what are some of the things that we're learning about kind of just overall kind of like what, psychological or emotional well-being 
and kind of how that translates into our physical health. There was a really interesting paper that was published, I think, in Nature last year. And people have always been looking for biological mechanisms in which the mind might impact the body. And they found this great structure linking the brain with the lymphatic system, which helps govern our immune system. So that might be one way where literally our thoughts can has a direct connection to our body and several systems. So that, that's really intriguing. When that came out, people said that literally textbooks have to be rewritten. And um, people couldn't see it before. They, they kept missing it for years and years. So there's growing evidence about the benefits of optimism, but you're probably thinking, well, my doctor can't just prescribe me to be more optimistic. It's not that simple. But Kim says there are proven strategies that can help people develop a more positive outlook on life. Some involve more in-depth cognitive behavioral therapy. Others start with a pen and a piece of paper. One's called best possible self. You think about your life in different domains. Maybe one is your personal relationship with your partner. Another one's like your uh, career. Another one's your friends. And then you think about the best possible outcome in each of these domains. And over the next six days, you vividly try to imagine it. Um, another one's l- writing three things that you're grateful for every night over a period of seven days. And another RC- randomized controlled trial showed that um, writing down acts of kindness that you've done for others over a period of two weeks has also raised optimism. So those are some of the easier ones. Some of the more involved ones, actually mindfulness meditation has been shown to increase optimism. Um, there are some classroom programs that have been shown to increase optimism, something called the Penn Resiliency Program, and some types of cognitive behavioral therapies. So I think the more time investment someone puts into something and the more they can change their patterns of thinking, the longer lasting the effect and the larger the impact. Where do you go from here with this research? It would be great if we could create these really short psychological interventions that have long lasting and large effects. And this has been actually done already in some other domains. So if these short uh, interventions can be created, then like you're saying, maybe we can as a healthcare system say, here's a toolkit of things that you can do. If so, you choose, if you want to choose optimism as something, here's some things that you can try. And then another thing would be, since this was all a correlation study, if we tried randomized studies where we try to induce optimism and see how their biology might be changing and their health behaviors might be changing, those are next steps. For Kim, this research into optimism and psychological well-being was actually inspired by his family, specifically his grandfather. After the Korean War, he was elected to be one of the uh, leaders of a large orphanage in Korea, because after the Korean War, there are many parents who died. And he worked in this orphanage for, for 30 years, and by all accounts, he was a really healthy guy. He was running around, taking care of people, and... Uh, eating well and probably exhausted at night because he's <laughs> running around. And then he retired and he was very healthy. However, over time, I saw that his health behaviors were really declining pretty quickly. And he eventually uh, passed away from heart complications. But later on, I I learned some more things. I had this idea that it might be the purpose in life or a will to live that was m- maybe driving these behaviors. So I, I studied that throughout graduate school, the link between purpose in life and health. And Kim has conducted research showing how this sense of purpose in life can influence our behavior. In a study of adults 50 and older, Kim found that those who volunteered were more likely to engage in preventative health care than non-volunteers. For example, volunteers were 47% more likely to get cholesterol checks and 30% more likely to get flu shots. They were also more likely to get various cancer screenings. A separate study found that older adults with greater psychological well-being were more likely to be physically active over an 11-year period. Now, in general, all adults become less physically active as they get older. What was notable, says Kim, is that those who had those higher levels of psychological well-being stayed more active as they aged. When you hear something like this, it intuitively makes sense uh, that people who are happier or more positive will be more likely to exercise or engage in other healthy behaviors. The goal of researchers like Kim is to quantify this, to build rigorous scientific evidence of the benefits of positive emotional well-being. When we boost these positive psychological factors, which is kind of like an umbrella term, some of the things under it is like optimism, a sense of purpose in life, people have a greater will to live. Therefore, they're more willing to take care of their bodies by, you know, eating better, sleeping better, and doing more preventive things. So that's one of the hypothesized mechanisms. And that is what we're seeing, at least statistically. There's actually some really intriguing randomized controlled studies that are coming out recently where people are tweaking these in small 
trials and actually seeing that health behaviors are changing. So one small study that was published in JAMA Internal Medicine, actually it was a trio of studies on different patient populations. One recently went through a heart procedure and they induced positive emotions in them. And over a period of a year, they actually found that in that group, compared to the control, they were 1.7 times more likely to achieve their physician-recommended levels of physical activity. The goal, says Kim, is to eventually take these findings about individuals and see if there's a way to more broadly influence psychological well-being. For example, are there policies that governments could implement which would support happiness and emotional resilience? It's really difficult to reduce diseases once it's already happened. And there is all these adages talking about... (laughs) Yeah, prevention. However, there are all these really interesting psychology and behavioral economics studies showing that we can potentially enhance these factors. And what if we can spread them systematically throughout society, uh, in school districts, in hospitals, and maybe even government policies, and put them in people's lives and make it kind of regular in people's lives so that they can actually have this resilience factor when they do face life challenges and health challenges. I think that's kind of an aspirational goal. I like to think of it as one tool in the toolkit of healthier living. Things we've heard like, you know, eat healthy, sleep better, and have more social relationships. I think this can be one additional thing. And as we see in all kinds of people, some people like pursuing certain paths and some people don't. And this is just another thing like that. You can decide to pursue it or you don't have to. And I don't think anyone should be judged for not doing it or doing it. That was Eric Kim talking about optimism and health. If you want to learn more about his work, just visit our website, hsph.me slash thisweekinhealth. And that's all for this edition of Harvard Chan This Week in Health. Coming up next week, rethinking charitable giving this holiday season. We'll look at how international aid agencies and non-governmental organizations use your donations and how you can give in a way that does the most good. In the meantime, you can always listen to our older episodes on SoundCloud, iTunes, or Stitcher. And if you can, take a few minutes to leave us a review.